When they looked at Bobby in 1968, they remembered Jack in 1961. Something in the American experience had been cut short by an assassination. It was something unfinished that we had to go back to and live out fully. An American tragedy had not been wept away. America looked at Robert Kennedy, but dreamed of Jack. Sometimes you may be glad. It all beckoned. It all looked so much the same. A brawling brood of Kennedys, rich, capricious. There was a democratic dynasty all in a row, if America would vote in the Kennedys. They set the tone and captured the headlines. Yet we are not a monarchy, we are a republic, and power does not pass through bloodlines. Perceptibly, 1968 was not 1961. The war in Vietnam had escalated. The riots had torn apart the cities. There was no crown to pass on. An election had to be won. The Kennedy style in Oregon. A vigorous walk along the beach. Good for cameras, good for image, good for a place on the local nighttime news. That year, all politicians felt obligated to walk near the water giving the impression that if elected, they could walk on the water. Hubert Humphrey walked at a slower and pudgier pace. His camera crew recorded his footsteps on the sands of time. Hubert, perhaps, was trying to show that if he walked with less vigor than Bobby, he was at least more contemplative. He covered up defects in the sand. Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew walked near the water, but they did not take off their ties or shoes. Republican walking was less wet and more conservative. You can get that tomorrow. Kennedy imitators were everywhere. A documentary made that year for a county race in New York followed a man named Wattler, who clearly modeled himself on the Kennedy fashion. By that year, Madison Avenue had figured out what made Kennedy run and win. Vigorous walking, leading America. The voice of a Madison Avenue consultant showed how in even a minor county race, the Kennedy Manor mattered. The whole concept of vigorous movement is very important to us here. We're trying to project dynamism, charisma, if you will. Uh, it includes the projection of youth. So, County, thank you. This particular campaign showed that the candidate was not walking ahead of his constituency, but following a printout. The Kennedy style, which always sampled public opinion, had been supplemented by computers. The patriotism matter clearly works for Walker. It makes many voters like him more. The computer said, Governor Rockefeller has held his own in Nassau County. Therefore, we recommend that he be encouraged to endorse Walkler. We are thrilled to be here with this wonderful crowd to support and get behind of and elect Sal Walkler, one of the really great comers in the Republican Party. The computer said, Both Republican strength and undecided voters are found among men. Tour bowling alleys when men's leagues are in session. Packaging doesn't help every product. Wackler lost. May in Oregon. Kennedy was fighting the challenges of Eugene McCarthy and Hubert Humphrey for the Democratic nomination. The vote was being further splintered by George Wallace. Oregon was a primary that the polls showed Kennedy should not have entered. This white middle-class state did not admire the Kennedy style, and for the first time, a Kennedy lost a primary. McCarthy won. When Bobby arrived in California, he was back in a state that responded to him. California thrives on turbulence and loves legends. He won. Kennedy mounted a platform to thank his followers. Television was being watched across town by the people who least admired the Kennedy style, the McCarthy supporters. The McCarthy workers, mostly students, saw Kennedy as a man who had first led the Vietnam War and then turned against it when it was politically opportune. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. 
but there is no confirmation repeat that Senator Sanity has been shot. shot the that is not confirmed. They don't know who's been and as we get more either. definite details, we'll bring them to you. carried his coffin to Washington. and two assassinations, three acts of violence whose shadows still fall on us today. Where we're going is to the election of Richard Nixon by way of the Democratic Convention held in Chicago during August of 68, for it was there at Chicago that the climactic scene of the year would occur. It was there that the styles of two generations would clash. Youth was pushing hard at age, and in 1968, age pushed back. In 1968, my generation thought many young people were barbaric and the young savages had to be taken in hand and civilized. Young people thought Emerson was right when he said, every hero becomes a bore at last. Youth was bored with the World War II generation that was leading the country. The counterculture said, we want the world and we want it now. They tried to storm the gates of the establishment that was sending them to war in Vietnam. The forces of the establishment fought back on the streets of Chicago in August of 68. But before we go to Chicago, we have to go to college. There were more than six million college students that year, and the one fight that united most of them centered on the draft. 1968 was the year draft deferment was ended for graduate students. The movie Alice's Restaurant was about draft dodging. Millions of college students did not want to put on a military uniform. Next, Guthrie Oliver. Okay. For date of birth, you put down Scorpio. I want this specific date. Okay. Arlo Guthrie's hit song of 68, later made into this movie, dealt with some of the ways to become 4F, draft deferred. Illness was the best way out. What's this Huntington's Korea? Incurable nerve disease. And you have it. Runs in the family. It says here, do you know of any reason why you might not qualify for military service? Not your father, not your grandmother. I could get it. No. You're here from us. Peace. Next, go with Milton. Sarge, give him heck. I'm bound for Canada, you know. And if you ever get a war without blood and gore, boy, I'll be the first to go. But until then, Mr. McNamara. Oh, I'm only 18, I got a rough 
just clean and I always carry a purse. I got eyes like a bat and my feet are flat and my ass was getting worse. Oh, and I think of my career and my sweetheart dear and my poor old invalid aunt. Besides, I ain't no fool, I'm going to school and I'm working in the defense plan. Students at 221 colleges rioted in 1968, and under every riot was the issue of the draft and the war. Many middle-class students protested against the nearest authority figure, the university. Columbia set the pattern. What the radicals did was seize five university buildings and lock everybody else out. They locked out their fellow students who wanted to get into the buildings for the education they had paid for. Though the campus was in turmoil, there was a feeling among all students that somehow college was a protected place whose values were above city, state, and federal government. The campus had to solve its problems by itself. These black and white films were made by friends of the radicals who had taken over the buildings. They never thought they were committing a crime, or if they did, they thought the university was committing a greater one by collaborating with the war-making government. They sat at the president's desk, drank his sherry, and looked for evidence. He found little of interest, but some unimportant papers were copied and others were burned. The students who were conducting illegal surveillance were themselves the subject of surveillance by the CIA. Under the law, the CIA had no right to spy on campus activities, but this memo shows they did it. It's from the CIA to the White House. Memorandum for Mr. Walt Rostow. The agency officer who has dealt with youth and student affairs in recent years wrote this report at my request. I am not distributing it except to you and John Gardner because the agency should not be reporting at all on domestic affairs of this sort. Richard Helms, director. The CIA knew then what we now know. The majority of students was basically conservative. Of the six million students enrolled in the more than 2,100 U.S. colleges and universities, the overwhelming majority are politically apathetic or staunchly conservative. Except on the issue of selective service, the student community appears generally to support the administration more strongly than the population as a whole. Strike! 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 It was only a visible and vocal minority that tore Columbia apart. The faculty was the group most shattered by the strike. Some felt the professors, by even negotiating with the radicals, sold out the majority of students. But the professors who supported the strike chose to see the university as an instrument of change rather than a protector of traditional educational values. The extremists grew bolder. They thought they were on the brink of bringing down the university. To their mind, Columbia would fall today, America would fall tomorrow, and the whole system would not defend itself. Don't be dissuaded by a lot of faculty who come around and say, talk about the right-wing reaction. The right-wing reaction just hasn't set in in two weeks, and we've been doing some pretty radical things in that time. The right-wing reaction is a faculty that some members of the faculty are always screaming about just isn't coming. The right-wing reaction among the students organizing just isn't coming. <laughs> Under the eyes of 300 newsmen, some thousand cops busted the halls of Ivy. When the police entered the Columbia campus and went after the kids who had seized university property, allegiances changed. A new loyalty was given in blood, not to class, creed, or color, but to generation. Blue-collar cops were too tough on white-collar students. On their side, the students felt that to be busted and to bleed on the barricades was a badge of courage. It was their duty to break the laws of a country which was fighting a dishonorable war. That's why the kids expected a lot of publicity and no punishment. Amnesty! 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 